You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show where we learn about making machine learning models work in the real world. I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Jeremy Howard created the Fast AI course, which is maybe the most popular course to learn machine learning, and there are a lot out there. He's also the author of the book, Deep Learning for Coders with Fast AI and PyTorch. And in that process, he made the Fast AI library, which lots of people use independently to write deep learning code. Before that, he was the CEO and co-founder of Enlytic, an exciting startup that applies deep learning to healthcare applications. And before that, he was the president of Kaggle, one of the most exciting earliest machine learning companies. I'm super excited to talk to him. So Jeremy, it's nice to talk to you. And in preparing the questions, I kind of realized that um, every time I've talked to you, there have been kind of a few gems that I've remembered that I would never think to ask about. Like one time you told me about how you learned Chinese and another time you gave me um, dad parenting advice, like very specific <laughs> advice. It's been actually super um, helpful. So it was kind of funny. Putting oh, great. <laughs> hey, tell me what, what dad parenting advice worked out. I'm, well, I'm, what you I'm, told I'm, me was um, when you change diapers, use a blow dryer to, to oh, change yeah. a, um, a really frustrating experience into like a really joyful experience. And yeah, it's like such absolutely. good advice. I don't know how you... I guess I can imagine how you thought of it, but it's... Yeah, I, yeah. No, they love the whooshing sound. They love the warmth. I'm kind of obsessed about dad things, so I'm always happy to talk about dad things. That is this podcast. Can though, we start so. with that? Uh, now uh, now uh, that my daughter's eight months old, do you have any, any suggestions for this? Oh she... my goodness, eight months old. <laughs> you know, it's like the same with any kind of learning. It's all about consistency. So I think that the main thing we did right with Claire was just, you know, this delightful child now is we were just super consistent. Like if we said like, you can't have X unless you do Y. We would never do, X, you know, give her X if you didn't do Y. And if we're like, if you want to take your scooter down to the bottom of the road, you have to carry it back up again. We read this great book that was saying like, if you're not consistent, it becomes like this thing. Like it's like a gambler. It's like sometimes you get the thing you want, so you just have to keep trying. So that's my number one piece of advice. And it's the same with like teaching machine learning. We always tell people that tenacity. Mm. It's the most important thing for a student. It's like to stick, stick with it, do it every day. I guess just in the spirit of questions, I'm I'm genuinely um, curious about. You know, you've built this, um, you know, kind of amazing framework and and sort of teaching thing that I think is maybe the most popular and most appreciated framework. I was wondering if you could you could start by telling me the story of what inspired you to do that and what was the the kind of journey to making you know Fast AI the curriculum and Fast AI the yeah. ML framework. So um, it was something that. My wife, Rachel, and I started together. Um, and um, so Rachel has a math PhD, super technical background, um, uh, early data scientist and engineer at Uber. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I have a f just scraped by a philosophy undergrad and have no technical background. But, you know, from both of our different directions, we both had this frustration that like neural networks in 2012, Super important, clearly going to change the world, but super inaccessible. And, you know, so we would go to meetups and try to figure out, like, how do we... Like, I knew the basic idea. I'd, I'd coded neural networks 20 years ago, but, like, how do you make them really good? There wasn't any kind of open source software at the time for running on GPUs. You know, Dan Sirison and Jürgen Schmidt, who his thing was available, but you had to pay for it. There was no source code. And we just thought, oh, we've got to change this because the history of technology leaps has been that it generally increases inequality because the people with resources can access the new technology and then that leads to kind of societal upheaval and a lot of unhappiness. So we thought, well, we should just do what we can. So we thought, um, how, how are we going to fix this? And so basically the goal was and still is be able to use deep learning without requiring any code so that, you know, because the vast majority of the world can't code. Um, we kind of thought, well, to get there, we should first of all see like, well, what exists right now, learn how to use it as best as we can ourselves, teach people how to best use it as we can, and then make it better, which requires doing research and then turning that into software and then changing the course to teach the hopefully slightly easier version. and repeat that again and again for a few years. Um, and so that's, we're kind of in that process. That's so interesting. Do you worry that um, the stuff you're teaching, 
you're, you're sort of trying to make it obsolete, right? Because you're trying right. to build higher level abstractions. Like I, I think one of the right. things that people really appreciate about your course is the sort of uh, really clear in-depth explanations of how these things work. Do you think that that's eventually yeah. going to be not necessary or how do you think about that? Yeah, um, to some extent. I mean, so if you look at the, the, the new book and the new course, um, the, the chapter one starts with like really, really foundational stuff around like what is a machine learning algorithm? What, what do we mean to learn an algorithm? What's the difference between traditional programming and machine learning to solve the same problem? Um, and those kinds of basic, basic foundations, I think, will always be useful, even at the point you're not using any code. I feel like even right now, if somebody's using like platform AI or some kind of code-free framework, you still need to understand these basics of like, okay, um, an algorithm can only learn based on the data you provide. You know, it's generally not going to be able to extrapolate to patterns it's not seen yet, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, we have so far released two new courses every year, you know, a part one and a part two every year, because every year it's totally out of date. And we always say to our students at the start of part one, look, you know, none of the details you're learning are going to be of any use in a year or two's time. There's a good, you know, when we were doing Theano and then TensorFlow and Keras, you know, and then plain PyTorch, we always say, look, don't worry too much about the software we're using because none of it's still any good. You know, it's all changing rapidly, um, you know, faster than JavaScript frameworks, but the concepts are important. And yeah, you can pick up a new library in, I don't know, a week, I guess. Do you, um, it seems like you've, uh, you've thought pretty deeply about um, learning both, you know, human learning and, and machine yeah. learning. Had, had you had, um, had you or Rachel had practice teaching before? Was this kind of your first teaching experience? Um, you know, I've actually had a lot of practice teaching of this kind, but in this really informal way, partly it's because I don't have a technical educational background myself. So I found it very easy to empathize with people who don't know what's going on because I don't know what's going on. And so way back when I was doing management consulting, you know, 25 years ago, uh, I was always using data-driven approaches rather than expertise and interview-driven approaches to solve problems because I didn't have any <laughs> expertise and I couldn't really interview people because nobody took me seriously because I was too young. So, uh, And so then I would like have to explain to my client and to the engagement manager, like, well, I solved this problem using this thing called linear programming or multiple regression or a database or whatever. And yeah, what I found was I very, well, I wouldn't say very quickly, but within a couple of years in consulting, I started finding myself like running training programs for what we would today call data science, but 20 something years before we were using that word. Yeah, basically teaching our client and our, you know, so when I was at AT Kearney, I ran a course for the whole company, basically, that every uh, associate MBA had to do in what we would today call data science, you know, a bit of SQL, a bit of regression, a bit of spreadsheets, a bit of Monte Carlo. So yeah, I've actually done quite a lot of that now you mention it. And uh, certainly Rachel also, um, uh, but uh, for her on um, pure math, you know, so she she ran some courses at Duke University and stuff for postgrads. And, so yeah, I guess we've both had some some practice and we're pretty passionate about it. So we also um, study the literature of how to teach a lot, which most teachers, weirdly enough, don't. So so that's good. Do you have do you feel like um there are things that you feel like uniquely proud of in, in your teaching or like things that you're doing particularly well compared to um, you know, other classes that people might take? Yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't say unique because there's always other people doing good stuff, you know. I think we're notable for two things in particular. One is um, code first and the other is top down. So, you know, I make a very conscious decision in kind of everything I do to focus on myself as the audience. 
I'm not a good mathematician, you know, I'm like I'm, I'm, I'm capable nowadays, but it's not something that's really in my, in, in my background and doesn't come naturally to me. For me, the best explanation of a technical thing is like an, an example in some code that I can run, debug, look at the inter intermediate inputs and outputs. So, so I make a conscious decision in my teaching to, to teach to people who are like me. And although um, most people at kind of graduate level in technical degrees are not like me, they've all done a lot of math. Most people that are interested in this material are like me. They're people who don't have graduate degrees and they're really underrepresented in the teaching group because like nearly all teachers are academics and so they can't empathize with people who don't love Greek letters, you know, and integrals and stuff. So yeah, so so it's so I always explain things by showing code examples. So, and then the other is top down, which is again the vast majority of humans, not necessarily the vast majority of people who have spent a long time in technical degrees and made it all the way to being professors, but most regular people uh, learn much better when they have context. Why are you learning this? What's an example of it being applied? You know, what are some of the pros and cons of using this approach before you start talking about, you know, the details of how it's put together? So, in we, this is really hard to do, um, but we try to make it so that every time we introduce a topic, it's because we kind of need to show it in order to explain something else or in order to improve something else. And this is so hard because obviously everything I'm teaching is stuff that I know really well. Um, and so it's really easy for me to just say like, okay, you start here and you build on this and you build on this and you build on this and here you are. And that's that's just the natural way to try to teach something, but it's not the natural way to, to learn it. So I, I don't think people realize how difficult top-down teaching is, but um, people seem to really appreciate it. Yeah, they, they do seem to really appreciate it. Do, do you think, um, I mean, I'd love to talk to Rachel about this directly, <laughs> but do you think Rachel has the same approach as you? Because it sounds like she has a pretty different background. Yeah, she does have a different background. Um, but she certainly has the same approach because we've talked about it and she, we both kind of, kind of jump on each other to say like, hey, you know, because we kind of do a lot of development together, or we did before she got onto the data ethics stuff more. Um, and sometimes, you know, I'll say to her, like, hey, that seems pretty bottom up, don't you think? And she'll be like, oh, yeah, it is. Damn it. Start again. You know, so we both know it's important and we both try really hard to do it, but we don't always succeed. And can you tell me about the um, the library that you built, like how that came about? Do you think it was necessary yeah. to do it to to teach yeah. the way you wanted to? Well, it's not. It's remember, the purpose of this is not teaching. So we want there to be no teaching. So the goal is that there, or minimal teaching, the goal is that um, there should be no code and it should be something you can pick up in half an hour and get going. So uh, the fact that we have to teach what ends up being about 140 hours of work is a failure, you know, we're still failing. Um, and so the only way to, to fix that is to create software, which makes everything dramatically easier. Um, so really the software is, that's actually the thing, that's actually our, our goal. Um, but we, we can't get there until, you know, we first of all teach people to use what already exists and to do the research to figure out like, well, why is it still hard? Why is it still too slow? Why does it still take too much compute? Why does it still take too much data? Like what are all the things that limit accessibility? do the research to try and improve each of those things a little bit. Okay, how can we kind of embed that into software? Yeah, the software is kind of the end result of this. I mean, it's still a loop, but eventually, hopefully it'll all be in the software. And I guess we've gotten to a point now where we feel like we understood some of the key missing things in deep learning libraries, at least. We're still a long way away from being no code, but we at least saw things like, oh, you know, basic object-oriented design is basic is largely impossible because tensors don't have any kind of semantic types. So let's add that and see where it takes us. And you know, kind of 
stuff like that. We really tried to get back to the foundations. Sure. Were there any other ones? That was a that was a good a good one. Any any other that come to mind? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I mean, dispatch is a key one. So the fact that that um, kind of Julia style dispatch is not built into Python. Um, so function dispatch on on typed arguments. We kind of felt like we had to fix that because really in for data science, the kind of data you have impacts what has to happen. Um, and so if you say rotate, then depending on whether it's a, a 3D CT scan or an image or a point cloud or a set of key points for a human pose, rotate semantically means the same thing, but requires different implementations. Um, so yeah, we built this um, kind of Julia inspired type dispatch system. Also like realizing that to go with, again, it's, it's really all about types, I guess. When you have semantic types, they need to go all the way in and out, by which I mean you put an image in, it's a pillow, you know, image object. It needs to come all the way out the other side as, you know, an image tensor. Um, go into your model, the model then needs to produce an image, you know, uh, a, 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 an image tensor or a category, you know, type or whatever, and then that needs to come out all the way to the other side to be able to be displayed on your screen correctly. So we had to make sure that the entire transformation pipeline was reversible, so we had to set up a new system of um, reversible composable transforms. Um, so this stuff is all like, we, as much as possible, we try to hide it behind the scenes. But without these things, our eventual goal of no code would be impossible because, um, you know, you would have to tell the computer like, oh, this tensor that's come out actually represents, you know, three bounding boxes along with associated um, categories, you know, and describe how to display it and stuff. So. It's all pretty foundational to both making the process of coding easy and then down the track over the next couple of years, you know, removing the need for the code entirely. And what did you, um, like, what was the big goal behind releasing a V2 of, of the library? That, that was kind of a bold choice, right? To, to just make yeah. a complete rewrite. Yeah. I'm, um, you know, I'm a big fan of, second system, <laughs> you know, the kind of the opposite of, of Joel Spolsky, you know, I, I, I love rewriting. I'm more, I mean, I'm no Arthur Whitney, but you know, Arthur Whitney who created K and KDB, um, uh, every version he rewrites the entire thing from scratch. Um, and he's done many versions now. Um, but that's, that's, I really like that as a general approach, which is like, if I haven't learned so much that my previous version seems like ridiculously naive and and pathetic, then I'm I'm not moving forwards, you know. So I do find every year I look back at any code I've got and think like, oh, that could be so much better. And then you rewrite it from scratch. And I did the same thing with the book. You know, I rewrote every chapter from scratch a second time. Um, so it's partly that, and it's partly also just that it took a few years to get to a point where I felt like I, I I actually had some solid understanding of what was needed, you know, the, the kind of things I just described. Um, and some of, a lot of it came from like a lot of conversations with um, Chris Latner, the, the inventor of Swift and LLVM. Um, so when we taught together, um, it was great sitting with him and you know, talking about like porting fast AI to Swift and like the type system in Swift and then working with um, Alexis Gallagher, who's like maybe the world's foremost expert on the t on Swift's value type system, and he helped us build uh, a new data block API for Swift. And so, kind of through that process as well, it, it made me realize, like, yeah, you know, this is um, this is actually a, a real lasting idea. And actually, I should mention it, go it goes back to the the very idea of the data block API, which actually goes back to fast AI version one, which is um, this idea that, and again, it's kind of based on really thinking carefully about the foundations. 
which is like rather than have a a library which every possible combination of inputs and outputs ends up being this totally different class, you know, with a different API and different ideas. Let's have some types that represent, that could be either an input or an output, and then let's figure out the actual steps you need. It's like, okay, you, you know, how do you figure out what the input items are? How do you figure out what the output items are? How do you figure out how to split out the validation set? How do you figure out how to get the labels? Um, so again, these things are just like, yeah, we, we, you know, came to them by stepping back and saying, what is actually foundationally what's going on here? And let's do it properly, you know. So FastAI 2 is really our first time where we just stepped back and, you know, literally I said, um, you know, so Silva and I worked on it and I said to Silva, like, we're not going to push out any piece of this until it's the absolute best we can make it, you know, right now. Um, which I know Sylvain kind of got a bit, you know, <laughs> thought I was a bit crazy sometimes, like the the Transforms API, Transforms API, I think I went through like 27 rewrites. Um, but, you know, I kept thinking like, no, this is not good enough, no, this is not good enough, <laughs> you know, um, until eventually it's like, okay, this is, this is actually good now. So is the hardest part the, um, the external APIs then? Because that does seem like it'd be really tricky to, to make that. I mean, that seems like an endless task to make these APIs like clear enough and organized. Well, they're never, um, I never think of them as external APIs. To me, they're always internal APIs. They're what I'm Because you want to make a, a bigger system. Yeah, they're what, what am I building the rest of the software with exactly? And, you know, we went all the way back to like thinking like, well, how do we even write software? You know, I'm a huge fan, of, I've always been a huge fan of the idea of literate programming, but never found anything that made it work. And, you know, we've been big proponents of Jupyter Notebook forever. Um, and it was always upsetting to me that I had this like Jupyter world that I loved being in and this like IDE world, which I didn't have the same ability to explore in a documented reproducible way and incorporate that exploration and explanation into the code as I wrote. Um, so yeah, we went all the way back and said like, oh, I wonder if there's a way to actually use Jupyter Notebooks to create an integrated system of documentation and code and tests and exploration. Um, it turns out the answer was yes. Um, so yeah, it's really like just going going right back at every point that I kind of felt like I'm less than entirely happy with the way I'm doing something right now is like to say, okay, can we fix that? Can we make it better? And Python really helped there, right? Because Python is so hackable, you know, the, the whole, the fact that you can actually go into the meta object system and change how type dispatch works and change how inheritance works. So like our type dispatch system has its own inheritance implementation built into it. It's, yeah, it's amazing you can do that. Wow, why? Um, because um, the type dispatch system needs to understand inheritance when it comes to how do I decide if you call a function on A and B, that you know, of, of, on, on types A and B, and there's something registered for that function which has some superclass of A and some higher superclass of B and something else with a slightly different combination, how do you decide which one matches, you know? Um, so in the first version of it, I, I ignored inheritance entirely and it would only dispatch if you had the ex types exactly matched or one of the types was none. Um, but then later on I added, yeah, I added inheritance. So now you can, you've got, um, this nice combination of multiple dispatch and inheritance, which is really convenient. Isn't, um, can you give me some examples of how the inheritance works with your types? Cause I would think it could get kind of tricky. Like what's even inheriting from what and the, the types that just quickly come to mind. Um, for me, like yeah. if you have an image with multiple bounding boxes, would that inherit from like just a, a raw image or how, that, can you... Yeah. So generally those kind of things will compose, you know? So, um, we, uh, I don't think we ever use multiple inheritance. Um, we, I, I try to stay away from it because I've always found it a bit hairy. Um, so instead things tend to be a lot more functional. Um, so, uh, you know, a black and white image inherits from image. 
Um, and I think a DICOM image, which is a medical image, also inherits an image. And then there are uh, transforms with the type signatures, which will take an image, and then there will be others which will take a DICOM image. And so if you call something with a DICOM image for which there isn't a registered function that takes a DICOM image, but there is one that takes an image, it'll call the image one. Um, and so, and then we kind of use a woe there so in ways where, you know, there'll be a kind of, um, we use a lot of duck typing, so there'll be like a, you know, call dot method, and dot method can be implemented differently in the various image subclasses. Um, and some, the other thing you can do with our type dispatch system is you can use a tuple of types, which means that that function argument can be any of those types, so you can kind of create union types on the fly, which is pretty convenient too. Are there parts of in the, the V2 that you're still not happy with? Or were you really able to realize that vision of... Everything? There are still some parts, yeah. there. Um, partly that happened kind of because of COVID. Um, and, um, you know, I, I um, unfortunately found myself the kind of face of the global masks movement, um, which didn't leave much room for more interesting things like deep learning. Um, so some of the things that we kind of added in towards the end, like... Um, some of the stuff around inference is still a little, possibly a little clunky. Um, but you know, it's only a, it's only a, it's only some little pieces. Like on, I mean, on the whole, inference is is pretty good. But for example, I didn't really look at at all at um, you know, how things would work with O and an X, for example. So kind of mobile or highly scalable serving. Um, um, also, the, the training loop needs to be a little bit more flexible to handle things like um, the Hugging Face Transformers API makes different assumptions that don't quite fit our assumptions. Um, TPU training, because of the way it like runs on this separate machine that you don't have access to, you kind of have to find ways to do things that um, have that accept really high latency. And so like for TPU, we kind of, um, it's particularly important because uh, we've built a whole new computer vision library that runs on the GPU, or runs in PyTorch, you know, which generally is targeting the GPU. And uh, PyTorch has a pretty good GPU launch latency along with a good NVIDIA driver. So we can do a lot of like stuff on the GPU around transformations and stuff. Um, that all breaks down with TPU. Um, because like every time you do another thing on the TPU, you have to go through that whole nasty latency. So yeah, there's a few little things like that that need to be improved. Is it important to you that your library is used um, widely outside of a learning context? Like is it is one of your goals to make it kind of widespread in, in production yeah. systems? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because cause the, the learning context hopefully goes away eventually. Hopefully there will be no fast AI course and it'll just be software. So if people are only using our software in a learning context, <laughs> it won't be used at all. Um, yeah, we want it used everywhere or something like it. I mean, I don't care whether it's fast AI or if somebody else comes along and creates something better. We just want to make sure that deep learning is, is accessible. That's super important. And the funny thing is um, because deep learning is so new and it kind of appeared so quickly, a lot of the decision makers, even commercially, are people that are highly academic. Um, and the whole kind of academic ecosystem is really important, um, much more so than in any other field I've ever been in. Um, so one of the things we need to make do is make sure that um, researchers are using fast AI. So we try, you know, and, and we're researchers too. So we try to make it very researcher friendly, and that's one of the key focuses really at, at the moment. Does that, um, sorry, I mean, I would think just naively like making something research friendly would involve kind of the opposite of, of making it like a single clean API, like, it, or like, a, you know, abstracting away all the details. Like I would think researchers would want to really tinker with the, the low level assumptions. Yeah. Well, that's why, um, that's why you need a layered API. Um, because um, the first thing to realize is, um, it's getting to the point now, or maybe it's at the point now, where most researchers doing research with deep learning are not deep learning researchers. You know, they're um, 
proteomics researchers or genomics researchers or animal husbandry researchers or whatever, you know, or astrophysics. Animal researchers. husbandry, I've not heard. <laughs> yeah, that's just... I, I was the keynote speaker at uh, a couple of years ago, the major international animal husbandry congress. So, Is that right? Uh, wow. Yes, yes absolutely. <laughs> I got a nice trip to Auckland with the family. It was very pleasant. In fact, um, Had Hadley Wickham's father organized it and he invited me. Yeah. Well I'm, well, I'm sorry, I cut you off. You're making an interesting point that I <laughs> interrupted for no reason. <laughs> I didn't know that you were so ignorant about animal husbandry, Lucas. I'm disgusted, dude. <laughs> I love I love all the unusual use cases of deep learning. Yeah. So it's definitely something I collect, but that's yeah. I have not heard that one. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, sorry, where were we? We were talking about, um, oh yeah, researchers. So you're doing research into a thing, right? So like, I don't know, maybe it's like you're trying to, find a better way to do um, gradient accumulation for FP16 training, or maybe you're uh, trying a new activation function, or maybe you're trying to find out whether, um, you know, this different way of handling four channel input works well for, you know, hyperspectral satellite imagery or whatever. And so, you, you know, the idea is to let you focus on that thing and not all the other things, but then you want all the other things to be done as well as possible because if you do a shitty job of all the other things, then you might say like, oh, my activation function is actually really good. But then somebody else might notice that like, oh no, it was just doing it like a, it was just doing a kind of a crappy version of data augmentation effectively. Because if we add dropout, then your thing doesn't help anymore. Um, so with a layered API, you can use the high level, easy, easiest bits with like all the defaults that work nicely together. And then you just pick the bit that you want and delve in as deep as you like. So there's kind of really four layers, uh, key layers in our API. So maybe you'll go in and create a new data block, or maybe you'll go in and create a new transform, or maybe you'll go in and create a new callback. So like the thing about fast AI is it's actually um, far more hackable than um, say Keras, right? Being take, take what I'm very familiar with. So like with Keras, you kind of have this, um, pretty well-defined transformation pipeline or tf.data if you're using that pretty well-defined set of atomic units you can use and if you want to customize them you're kind of out of luck you know often it requires going and creating a new tf op in c++ or something so it really helps using pytorch they kind of provide these really nice low latency primitives and then we build out everything out of those low latency primitives and we kind of gradually layer the APIs on top of each other and we make sure that they're very well documented all the way down. So you don't kind of get to a point where it's like, oh, you're now na you're now in the internal API, good luck. It's like, no, nope, it's all external API um, and it's all documented and it all has tests and it all has examples and it all has explanations. So you can put, put your research in at the point that you need it. Needed. I see. But I guess when you talk about academics then, or, or researchers, sorry, not academics, uh, you're, you're imagining like actual machine learning researchers researching on machine learning itself versus like an animal husbandry researcher who needs an application of machine learning. I guess yeah, you're both. speaking to both, yeah. Yeah, right. both. Um, and so, I mean, it's much easier for me to understand the needs of ML researchers because that's what I do and that's who I generally hang out with. Um, but there's a lot of overlap. Like I found back in the days when we had conferences that you could go to, um, you know, as I walked around Europe's, a lot of people would come up to me and say like, oh, I just gave this talk or I just gave this poster presentation. And three years ago, I was a fast AI student. And before that, I was a meteorologist or a astrophysicist or neuroscientist or whatever. And, you know, I used your course to understand the subject. And then I used your software and that I brought in these ideas from astrophysics or neuroscience or whatever and now I'm here I am presenting them at Neurips. And so there's kind of like this yeah really interesting overlap now between the worlds of ML research and domain expertise in that increasingly domain experts are becoming you know pretty well noted and well respected ML researchers as well because you kind of have to be you know like if you want to do a real kick-ass job of medical imaging, for instance, there's still a lot of foundational questions you have to answer about like, how do you actually deal with large 3D volumes 
um, you know, it's still, these things are not solved. And so you do have to become a really good deep learning researcher as well. You know, I think one of the things that, that I always worry about for myself is kind of, um, you know, getting out of date. Like I remember being in my early twenties and looking at some of the, you know, the tenured professors that were my age now and thinking, boy, you know, they've just not stayed current in the state of um, machine learning. And then, you know, I started a a company and I kind of, you know, realized that, um, you know, I, I actually wasn't staying, you know, up to date myself and, you know, kind of often stuck in like older techniques that I was more comfortable with or like languages I was more comfortable with. And yeah. I feel like one of the things that you do just phenomenally well from, at least from the outside mm-hmm. is, is staying kind of really current and on top of stuff. And yeah. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on how you do that because I, well, I mean, I gotta say, I really admired what you did with um, moving away from, from your world of crowdsourcing into, into deep learning. And I think you took like a year or so just to figure it out. Right. Mm-hmm. Not many people do that, you know, and, and, and I think a lot of people assume they can't because um, if you get to, I don't know, your mid thirties or whatever, and you haven't learned a significant new domain for the last decade, you could easily believe that you're not capable of doing so. So I think you'd kind of have to do what you do, which is just to decide to do it. I mean, for me, I took a rather extreme decision when I was 18, which was to make sure I spent half of every day learning or practicing something new for the rest of my life, um, which I've stuck to, certainly on average. Um, nowadays it's, yeah, nowadays it's more like 80%. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, um, so for me, I mean, it's weird. I, my brain still tells me I won't be able to understand this new thing because I start reading something and I don't understand it straight away. And my brain's like, okay, this is too hard for you. So you kind of have to push through that. Um, But yeah, for me, I kind of had this realization, you know, as a teenager that um, learning new skills is this high leverage activity. Um, And so I kind of hypothesized that if you keep doing it for your whole life, like I noticed nobody did, like nobody I knew did. And I thought, well, if you did, wouldn't you get this kind of like exponential returns? And um, so I thought I should try to do that. So that's that's kind of my been my approach. Oh, so you reasoned your way into that choice. That's amazing. Is it is it like a um do you do you have to kind of fight your immediate instincts to do that or is it kind of a pleasure to My instincts are fine now. What you do I do have to do is to fight. Well, not anymore, not now that I work with my wife um and you know, I'm working with Sylvain who's super understanding and understood me and is similar, but for nearly all my working life fighting or at least <laughs> dealing with the people around me. Um, because if somebody's like, particularly when you're the boss and you're like, okay, we urgently need to do X and somebody can clearly see that like, why the fuck are you like using Julia for the first time to use X? We don't even know Julia. You could have had it done already if you just used Perl or Python or some shit that you already knew. And it's like, well, you know, <laughs> I just wanted to learn Julia. <laughs> um, So, yeah, it's like it drives people around me crazy that I'm working with because everybody's busy and it's it's hard to, in the moment, appreciate that like, okay, this moment isn't actually more important than every other moment for the rest of your life. And so if you don't spend time now getting better at your skills, then the rest of your life, you're going to be a little bit slower and a little bit less capable and a little bit less knowledgeable. So that's the hard bit. It also sounds to me like just from the examples that you've given that you have a real bias to learning by doing. Is is that right? Like, do you yeah. also like you know, kind of read papers and synthesize that in a different way? Yeah, but I, if I read a paper, I only read it until I get to the point where I decide it's something I want to implement or not. Um, or that there's some idea that I want to take away from it to implement. Um, yeah, so I, like I... Um, I find doing things, I don't know, I'm a very intuitive person. So I find doing things and experimenting a lot. I kind of get a sense of how things kind of fit together. I I really like the way Richard uh, Feynman talked about his research uh, and his understanding of papers was that he um, always thinks about a physical analogy every time he reads a paper and he doesn't go any further on a paper until he has a physical analogy in mind. And then he always found that he could spot the errors in papers straight away by recognizing that the physical analogy would 
word breakdown. So I'm kind of a bit like that. I'm always looking for the for the context and the understanding of what it's for and then try to implement it. I see. So should we expect the next version of Fast AI to be in a new language? Have you, have you thought about moving away from Python? <laughs> with your oh, I mean, obviously I have because I looked at Swift, you know. Um, and sadly, you know, Chris Latner left Google. Um, so... I don't know, you know, they've got some good folks still there. Maybe they'll make something great of it. But, but you know, um, I tend to kind of follow people, like, you know, people who have been successful many times, and Chris is one of those people. So, yeah, I mean, what's next? I don't know. Like, it's certainly, like, Python is not the future of machine learning. It, it can't be, you know. It's, um, it's so nicely hackable, but it's so frustrating to work with a language where, you can't do anything fast enough unless you, you know, uh, call out to some external CUDA or C code, and you can't run anything in parallel unless you like put it on a whole other process. That, like, I find working with Python, there's just so much overhead in my in my brain to try to get it to work fast enough. Um, it's obviously fine for a lot of things, but not really in the deep learning world or not really in the machine learning world. Um, so like, I really hope that Julia is really successful because like there's a language with a nicely designed type system and a nicely designed dispatch system. And most importantly, it's kind of Julia all the way down. So you can get in and write your GPU kernel in, in, in Julia, or you can, you know, the, the, all the basic stuff is implemented in Julia all the way down until you hit the LLVM. Sorry, this is an embarrassing question. Is Julia's kind of like MATLAB? Is that what I should be thinking? Or? It was designed to be something that MATLAB people could could use, but um, no, it's more like I don't know, like Common Lisp meets MATLAB meets Python. So sounds um, a little bit like R, maybe. <laughs> um, you see, R has some nice ideas, but um, the you know the the R object system. This I mean, a there's too many of them, and b they're all such a hack. And then c it's because it's so dynamic, it's very slow. So again, you have to implement everything in something that's not R, and R just becomes a glue language on top of it. I mean, I spent so so many years writing writing R, and it's certainly better than what came before. But I never enjoyed it. Um, so Julia is a compiled language. And it's got a rich type system, and uh, it, it's entirely based on function dispatch um, using the type system. It's uh, got a very strong kind of metaprogramming approach, so that's why you can write your CUDA kernel in Julia, for example. Uh, you know, it's it's got um, autograd again; it's written in Julia, um, so it's it's got a lot of nice features. But unfortunately, it's um, hasn't really got the corporate buy-in yet. So it's highly reliant on a kind of this core group of super smart people that, that started it and now run Julia Computing, which doesn't seem to have a business model as far as I can tell, other than keep getting funding from VCs, which works for a while, but at some point <laughs> stops. <laughs> As I guess know, what is the yes I know what what is the fast AI business model is there a business model the fast AI business model is that I take money out of my bank account to to pay for things I need and that's about it <laughs> awesome well you know we always end with two questions I want to make sure we we have time for that to to have a little bit of consistency here um and the first one is um you know when you when you look at the different topics and um you know, kind of machine learning broadly defined. Is there a topic that you think that people should pay a lot more attention to than they generally are paying attention to? Yes. Um, and I think it's the world of deep learning outside of the area that you're familiar with. Um, so for example, when I got started in NLP, I was shocked to discover that nobody I spoke to in the world of NLP had any familiarity with the last three or four years of development in computer vision. Um, the idea of like transfer learning, for example, and how incredibly flexible it was. Um, so that's what led to ULM fit, 
um, which in turn led to GPT, which in turn led to GPT-2. And before ULM fit happened, every NLP researcher I spoke to, I said, like, what do you think, you know, about this idea of like super massive transfer learning from language models? And everybody I spoke to in NLP said, that's a stupid idea. And everybody I spoke to in computer vision said, yes, of course, I'm sure everybody does that already. So yeah, I think in general, people are way too specialized in deep learning. And there's a lot of good ideas in other parts of it. Interesting. Cool. Um, and then our, our final question we always ask, and I, I kind of wonder, you'll have an interesting perspective on this. You know, typically we're talking to people that are um, trying to, you know, use machine learning model for some purpose, like animal husbandry, <laughs> but you've sort of seen this wide range of, of applications. And um, when you look at, when you look across the things that you've seen kind of go from like ideation to like deployed thing that's working and, and useful, where do you see the, the biggest bottleneck? I mean, this, this, the projects I've been involved in throughout my life around machine learning have always been successfully deployed, you know, so I kind of get frustrated with all these people who tell me that machine learning is just this abstract thing that no one's actually using. Um, I think a big part of the problem is there's kind of people that understand business and logistic and process management, and there's kind of people that understand AI and algorithms and data, and there's not much connectivity between the two. So like I spent 10 years working as a management consultant. So all my life was logistics and business processes and HR and all that stuff. You know, It's kind all. of hard to picture as a management consultant. I think you must have been a surprising yeah, <laughs> consultant. I tried to fake it as best as I could, um, for sure. I've noticed a lot of people in the kind of machine learning world really underappreciate the complexity of dealing with constraints and finding opportunities and disaggregating value chains or they'll do the opposite and they'll just assume it's so hard that it's impossible without realizing there's like you know large groups of people around the world who spend their lives studying these questions and finding solutions to them um, so i think in general yeah i'd love to see um better cross-disciplinary teams and more people on the kind of the mba side developing kind of AI skills and more people on the AI side kind of developing understanding of business and teams and all that I mean I guess stuff. I guess you have like this broad view um you know from your background you know and and you've watched these ML projects kind of get deployed and useful so I guess like maybe the question is like more like like were there points that sort of surprised you with their their level of difficulty to just to kind of move through it like did, did you have like mishaps where you, um, you know, you thought the model was working and then when it was deployed into production, it didn't, you know, it didn't work as well as you were hoping or thought it would? No, not at all. Um, and I know that sounds weird, but um, it's just, you know, even a small amount of background in like doing the actual work that the thing you're building is meant to be integrating with. You know, I, I, I spent 10 years, uh, eight years working on an insurance pricing business entirely based on operations research and machine learning. But before that, uh, you know, the last four or five years of my management consulting career was nearly entirely in insurance. So, you know, there's not much very surprising that, that happens. I know, I know the people, I know the processes. Um, and so that's why I think like, I would much rather see, I don't know, like if somebody's going to do a, a paralegal AI business, I'd much rather see a paralegal do it than an AI person do it. Or if they're going to do a like, you know, HR recruiting AI business, I'd much rather see someone with an HR recruiting background do it. Like it's, it's super difficult. Like there's just no way to understand an industry really well without doing that industry for, for a few years, I think. And I think. what would you, so like, you know, because I know some of these people and I get this question all the time, I'll channel a question that I'm sure is in people's heads watching this. So if you are that, that, you know, paralegal who's starting, you know, a paralegal AI enabled business, how would you do the AI part? Um, well, obviously I would <laughs> take the fast AI courses. I mean, I would, I mean, seriously, I would make sure I was good at coding. You know, I'd spend a year working on coding um, and yeah I mean the fast AI courses are absolutely designed for for you and I would be careful of bringing on a so-called AI expert 
until you've had a go at doing it all yourself because I found like most people in that situation for, for obvious reasons feel pretty intimidated by the AI world and kind of a bit humbled by it or a bit overwhelmed by it and they'll bring on you know, a self-described expert, they have no ability to judge the expertise of that person. So they end up bringing somebody who's just good at projecting confidence, um, which is probably negatively correlated with actual effectiveness. Um, so I'd say, yeah, do it, do it yourself for, for a year, build the best stuff you can. I do find a lot of fast AI alum with kind of backgrounds of domain experts are shocked when they then get involved in the world of AI experts and they find they're much better at training models that actually predict things correctly than the modeling experts are. I'm sure you've had that experience as somebody who, you know, like me, doesn't have a technical background in this area. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This is a, uh, this is super fun and educational for me. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. My pleasure.